All right. How's everybody doing? Good. Doing good? All right. Well, I want to talk about this age-old concept of faith and works. Um, we preach a radical, strong message of grace here. And some people would call it hyper, hyper grace. That's one term that I've heard thrown around the body of Christ a lot as like a warning. Watch out for those, those hyper grace churches. You know, they, they go too far with the grace of God. They make, they, uh, they, they make it so it's okay if you're going to be involved in, in uh, sin and, and make it seem like there's no need for repentance or turning to the Lord or whatever it is. And there's a lot of misunderstanding and misinterpretation of the grace of God. And, um, and so I want to just set the record clear this morning. And uh, this is really nothing new, even as far as us as a church, things that we've talked about. We have talked about this before, but I wanna, I wanna try to pinpoint it a little bit more deeply. And so uh, we're gonna look at that famous passage of that faith without works is dead. And it is, it is a controversial passage throughout even church history, Protestant, Catholic, universal church history. This passage has been very controversial. In fact, Martin Luther, who was responsible for igniting the Protestant Reformation that changed the face of the world, Martin Luther advocated that we remove the book of James from the Bible. This is like one of our forefathers of the Protestant movement said, we need to get rid of the book of James because James is, 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 removing, gra is removing the need for just grace alone, sole fide, you know? Just grace alone, um, faith alone, the need for faith and all of that. So. Um, so Martin Luther had, had some issues with James, and there was wrestling that happened back and forth back then. So um, thankfully, the Holy Spirit prevailed, and the book of James remained in the Bible, and there is so much grace in the book of James when you have the correct lens to read it. It's amazing. So, um, so we're going to get into that, but first, I have a Greek word for you today. Um, I'm going to give you these Greek words. It's really the same word, but a different form of it. Um, I'm going to give you the adjective and the, the noun, or the adjective and the verb version of it. And uh, these are going to be little clues for you, okay? As we go through James and we go through other scriptures, we're going to go through a lot of scriptures this morning, okay? They're going to be little clues. You ever see Blue's Clues? Remember that show? Yeah, yeah. You know, Steve. And he would get, what, little, little paw prints? Little clues telling him the answer to some problem or explaining something, you know, and he'd have to keep an eye on these clues. So I'm gonna give you the clues right up front and then they're gonna show up. I don't have paw prints on the screen, but they'll show up as we go through the Bible. And it's gonna lead to a deeper understanding of some of these scriptures. So, um, so here, here's, here's the word. I'm gonna make you repeat it after me. The first word up there, the top word, that's the adjective. And that word right there is the adjective for mature or of full age, okay, or complete. That is the word teleos. Everybody say teleos. teleos. Say it again, teleos. Okay, mature, of full age. The bottom word there is the verb form, which means to make mature, to complete, or to finish, or to perfect, or to bring to full age, okay? And the way you say that word is teleao. Go ahead, say it again, teleao. And the first word is teleos. Second word is? I just think it's a cool word, so I wanna make you say it over and over again. All right, just keep those words in mind. We're gonna get back to them shortly, okay? All right. So, how many of you are familiar with uh, the concept of the milk and the meat? Have you heard that lingo thrown around before? Okay, well, here, here's how it's often said in, 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 in churches. I, I hear, you know, Christians just say, this is stuff Christians say, all right? They'll, they'll talk about a certain church or a certain pastor, and they'll say, you know, that church just preaches the milk. You know, it's just the milk. It's just... When they say that, they mean like it's just like shallow teaching or superficial stuff. But then they'll say, but that guy, that pastor, that church, they teach the meat. And the meat, that's, that's the deeper stuff. That's the deeper things of God. And, uh, you know, they say it like that too to make it sound extra holy. Oh, God. But, um, 
But that, that's kind of, if you're not familiar with, the, with this terminology, it does come from the Bible, and we're going to go to those passages. Um, that's terminology that gets used. There's like milk pastors, like people will say, Joel Osteen, he's one of those milk guys or something, you know. And they'll say, oh, you know, John Piper, Mike Bickle, that's the meat guy, you know. And they'll just, they'll, we assign names and divisions. It's really sad. But anyway, um, the milk and the meat. I want to propose a little bit of a different interpretation of that based on the scriptures that this comes from. So we're going to look at those scriptures, but first I'm going to give you uh, what I think it means, okay? And then we'll, we'll look at the, the Bible scriptures and you can be the judge and you can discern it, okay? Um, whenever you read something in the Bible, a term, a concept, you have to understand that there's a cultural context to it. Certain words that are used meant something differently to the writer than how we interpret them. And it's kind of the case with milk here, not that drastic, but when they wrote down milk in these passages in the New Testament, um, they weren't thinking of the mass distribution of big gallon plastic bottles sitting on ShopRite shelves everywhere and just that, that's that the immediate image that comes to their mind. Unless you're a farmer or involved in distribution, when I say milk and I ask you to think of that image in your mind, you're gonna think of something like that, a glass of milk or, you know, a half gallon or a plastic jug. That's what's gonna come into most of our minds. When they thought of milk culturally back then, they thought of sheep and goats and cow sometimes. They thought more closely and directly to the animal that it came from. And back then, they got most of their milk from sheep and from goats and sometimes from cow as well. Now, these animals were the animals that were used for sacrifice they would very quickly associate those animals both with the milk they produce for our sustenance and for other purposes, but also with the sacrifices that they were used in the Old Testament system. Now, Jesus Christ is called the sheep of God. Did you know that? Okay, it's the lamb of God, but a lamb is a sheep, okay? Baby sheep. And... That's a literal title that's given to him in scriptures. He's, he's the lamb. He's the baby sheep of God. And it's a very tender term. And all throughout the Old Testament, there are examples of sheep and goats and even cows, right, that are sacrificed to atone for sin. Now, this is what's going through their mind with these animals. I want to propose to you that the milk of the word in the Bible is the message of Christ's sacrifice. It's the milk that flows from the Lamb of God, the scapegoat of heaven. Jesus is also the scapegoat um, who was sent into the wilderness of death on our behalf. Jesus Christ. The milk is not shallow. It's not superficial, but it is very simple. The milk is the word of Christ's finished work. Now, the meat... The meat that people ate in Bible times, just like today, was from the same animals that they got their milk from, right? They ate the meat of lamb and goat and cow. So the meat and the milk come from the same entity, but the meat is the muscle, and it's the fat and the actual animal itself that was sacrificed. It is that which enabled the animal in its life to move and work and live. The meat represents action. It represents the life of the one who gave his life for us. The meat is Christ in action. It's the life of Christ, the movement of Christ. So the meat and the milk all come from the same place, but the meat is the flesh of Jesus. And the meat for us is Jesus being made flesh in us and in our relationships. It's you living like Jesus. Because you have digested the milk of the gospel to such a degree that it has strengthened you and empowered you and changed you from the inside out to truly live according to who you already are as one who is united to Christ, holy and pure. So the meat is about maturity. That simple. A mature believer, somebody who believes the gospel and has come into the maturity of Christ in them, that central revelation of the cross coming out. 
Now I want to show you some of the scriptures to back this up a little bit, okay? So this is uh, John 4, good old King James Version here. Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of God, or the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. So the meat also corresponds to the finished work of Christ, but it is the outworking of it. It is the doing of the will of God. And Jesus did that fully, perfectly. He loved the Lord his God, and he loved his neighbor as himself. Here's another verse, Hebrews 5. It says, But strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Now, did you catch Blue's paw print? The Greek word is up there, and it was in the last slide too. Let's go back to this one. What word there did we learn the Greek for before? Yes, to finish. To finish, that is which one? The verb or the adjective? The verb. Say if you're really paying attention. What's the verb? Teleaho. Yes, you got it. Teleaho. Of, yeah, oh no, to make mature, to finish, to complete, okay? This word right here, strong meat belongs to them that are of full age. Which one's that? To laos. Thank you. You guys are good this morning. All right. That is the adjective, to laos. So they both mean the same thing, and it's talking about maturity. That simple. It's a very biological term of coming into maturity, um, growing up from a baby to a full-grown person. Strong meat belongs to someone who's mature, someone who is manifesting the life of Christ, okay? And that's all it is. That's all that it is. It's somebody living out the gospel. Now, here's the kicker. Here's the main text that this whole milk versus meat thing comes from. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. This is Paul writing to a church in Corinth um, with some tough words for them, words of a father who really wants to see his church, his spiritual children rise up into their full identity. And he writes this, I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. Now there, you see the reference to immaturity there, babes. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it. And even now... You are still not able, for you are still carnal. Now, then he's going to define carnality, which is just another way of saying immature, okay? He says, for where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? Whew. I want to read that same verse for you, that last verse from the Mirror Translation, the Mirror Bible. Um, different paraphrase of the scriptures. I don't have it on the screen. Let me read it to you. He said, your heated debates and divisions prove that you are totally missing the point of the gospel. You behave like any other spiritually unenlightened person, religiously obsessed with petty party politics while missing the essence of the message. All right, I feel like I'm treading on some dangerous ground here. All right, the milk of the word, let me make it very clear, the milk of the word, the pure milk of the gospel, as Peter said, the milk that flows from the Lamb of God, that milk is the word that declares that you are no longer an envious, bitter, argumentative person anymore. You've been forgiven, but not only have you been forgiven, you have been changed on the inside, set free, made holy, and now filled with the fruits of mercy and kindness. So here's how it goes. You don't put aside the milk teachings and graduate to the meat teachings. The meat is the result of drinking the milk. The meat is just the milk in action. That simple. See, Paul reprimanded the church for behaving like mere men, he said, mere humans. He says that because the milk of the gospel, 
okay, the word of the cross declares that we are no longer mere humans. We're no longer mere men or women. We are in union with Jesus Christ. We're filled with all the fullness of Christ. So hear me clearly on this. To be carnal doesn't mean that you still have this evil, dirty flesh. That's a lie. To be carnal means that you don't know who you are. You don't know that you're already perfect in Jesus, that you are his image and likeness right now. So for us as a body, as a family, I believe God is moving us unto the meat. Does that mean that we move away from teaching the gospel? No, yeah, not at all. That means we are beginning to live out the gospel even more, even as we continue to celebrate it together. So there are two other words that you can use in place of milk and meat. And those two words are faith and works. And with that, I wanna look at the book of James. Chapter two in James, I'm gonna read this from the message translation. So helpful to read other translations of the scriptures. Um, just helps give you some fresh perspective. You can always go back to your King James or NIV and use that as a compass, but it's so helpful to read other translations to get more of a fuller understanding. So I'm gonna read James 2, verse 14. All right, dear friends, dear friends, can we just pause right there? Let's hear James's love. Dear friends, do you think you'll get anywhere in this if you learn all the right words but never do anything? Does merely talking about faith indicate that a person really has it? For instance, you come upon an old friend dressed in rags and half starved and say, good morning, friend, be clothed in, cl in Christ, be filled with the Holy Spirit and walk off without providing so much as a coat or a cup of soup. Where does that get you? Isn't it obvious that God talk without God acts is outrageous nonsense? I can already hear one of you agreeing by saying, sounds good, you take care of the faith department, I'll handle the works department. Not so fast. You can no more show me your works apart from your faith than I could show you my faith apart from my works. Faith and works, works and faith fit together hand in glove. In other words, the milk and the meat are the same, it's just Christ. It's the revelation of Christ and Christ in you. Do I hear you professing to believe in the one and only God and then observe you complacently sitting back as if you had done something wonderful? That's just great, demons do that, but what good does it do them? Use your heads. Do you suppose for a minute that you can cut faith and works in two and not end up with a corpse on your hands? Man. Wasn't our ancestor Abraham made right with God by works when he placed his son Isaac on the sacrificial altar? Isn't it obvious that faith and works are yoked partners, that faith expresses itself in works? The, that the works are works of faith. That's the key right there. The full meaning of believe in the scripture sentence, Abraham believed God and was set right with God, includes his action. It's that mesh of believing and acting that got Abraham named God's friend. Is it not evident that a person is made right with God, not by a barren faith, but by faith fruitful in works? And here's where I think he gives the most beautiful analogy, which we're gonna unpack together as he closes this point up. He says, the same with Rahab, the Jericho harlot. Wasn't her action in hiding God's spies and helping them escape that seamless unity of believing and doing what counted with God? The very moment you separate body and spirit, you end up with a corpse. Separate faith and works and you get the same thing, a corpse. Okay, so James is giving us this amazing picture. 
He's painting a picture for us. He's given us an analogy, and he's talking about two things here, body and spirit, in teaching us about faith and works. So I want you to think about this for a moment, okay? How many of you have been to a wake before or have seen a dead body in one way or another? How many of you have seen a deceased body? Okay, when you've seen the body, something's missing, right? Right, it's, it's not even like they're sleeping. It's not like they're sleeping. Something, and it's not even like they're just a little pale, right? There's something missing. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Okay, what's missing? The spirit of that person, yeah. So the body simply gives expression for the spirit within. So think about this. When your spirit is down, your face is long, right? It, 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 these are more than just expressions saying my spirits were down that day. No, like literally, when your spirit's down, it affects your body. You have a frown. Your shoulders hang a little lower, right? But when your spirit is rejoicing, you're more up. There's more energy. It kind of elevates you physically, even takes your lips and pulls them up towards your eye into something called a smile. Right? There's like this energy of your spirit within you pulling you up. And then your tongue and your throat and your mouth start to make these sounds that we call laughter. <laughs> Crazy. Laughter is just a physical manifestation of a joyful spirit. Side note, this is why it boggles my mind that some people don't think you should be laughing in church. Like, it doesn't make any sense at all. Anyway, moving on. Your body proves the existence of a spirit. So if your body was lifeless and cold, not smiling, not frowning, just lifeless, stale, right? It would be proof that there's no spirit within it. That body is dead, not alive. So you can start to see this beautiful analogy and picture here to faith and works. And this is what I want us to get as a church community as far as this whole grace message. If you hear anything else this morning, hear this. Our works are a visible expression of our living faith. When a person truly believes in their true identity in Christ, when they digest and receive the love of God poured out on the cross, it does and will move them to expression. That's because the milk changes you. If it's not changing you, you're not drinking it. You might be getting served the milk of the word every Sunday, but you ever hear the expression, you can lead a horse to water, right? Well, you can lead a purse to the milk too, but you, uh, a person, you can lead them to the milk, but you can't, can't force them to drink it. Oftentimes a person will get served milk like this on a Sunday morning, and they get the cup and they sit there and it gets filled up on their way out in the garbage because their cup holder in the car, spiritually seeking, is filled with other focuses, other passions, and other voices. And they don't have room for that cup. So good works of love and of Christ-likeness are proof of truly drinking the gospel. Drinking the gospel changes the way you live and it changes the way you treat people. If there's not a change in how we treat our spouses, our neighbors, and even our enemies, then guess what? You don't really believe the gospel. Okay, that's how blunt James is being in his letter. And that's why Martin Luther took a little bit of an issue with this. But he's making a good point. There's actually so much good in here because James is not watering down grace by any means. He's saying that grace is so powerful, the knowledge of your forgiveness and your identity is so strong that it will move you to action if you truly receive it and believe it and give your heart to it. It will. This blew my mind this morning. How many people have a Bible app? 
Okay, there's this Bible app that you can get, the most popular one, I think it's just called the Bible, has reading plans. And someone this week sent me a reading plan called Union with Christ. They thought I would like it. I'm like, that's awesome. There's a reading plan called Union with Christ. Great. So I, I read a little bit this week, seven days, and I stopped reading it. This morning, I had some time as I was eating breakfast. I'm like, let me just pull that thing out. I get to day three. I'm gonna pull it up for you. This is the daily reading from today. He said, only union with Christ allows us to read the book of James, not as a crushing burden, but as an uplifting possibility. If you are in Christ, James becomes encouraging, even beautiful to you. You can persevere under trial. You can have a living faith. You can tame your tongue. You can rest in not knowing what tomorrow will bring, and you can love the poor because you are married to Christ. James describes the life that Christ died to enable you to live. I was like, thank you, Lord. Okay, I guess this is the message. Now, this is the response that comes from people, and I've given this same response to myself and to the Lord, so I get it. But this is the response often. It's just, Nick, it's hard this is hard, what you're talking about, hard. You know, my emotions get out of control. I've got so many issues. I've got wounds from my past. I got hurt. People frustrate me, and then they do it over and over and over again. You know, it's hard to be like Christ. Listen carefully to me. Your emotions are subject to what you believe. This year, do yourself a favor and stop blaming your emotions and other people for your lack of Christ-likeness. Let's start rising up as men and women of God and believe in the freaking gospel. Really. And as you do that, guess what? Your emotions will bow their knee to your faith. They will. And this is why we're never gonna stop preaching the finished work of the cross, by the way, because faith comes by how? Hearing. Hearing. Now again, it's hearing and receiving. It's not just sitting in a seat. But it comes by hearing the word of what God has done in Christ. And we need to hear, we need to drink continually. Even when we feel like giving up on the message. In fact, I'll say this, especially when we feel like giving up on the message. That is the moment we need to cling to it more than ever, even if we feel everything in our body is against it. I want to show you how James opens up. This is another famous and difficult passage from good old Apostle James. Chief apostle of the church of Jerusalem. Had some tough words for them, but a lot of wisdom. He said, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work. There it is again. So that you may be mature. There it is. What's that word? Which one? To leos. To leos. Mature, that's the adjective. And complete, not lacking anything. Now, we know in Christ that we don't lack anything. This, again, is why there's been some people over the centuries that have said, is, is James really throwing away the finished work of the cross? Like, what, you know, what is, do we really need this book in the New Testament? There was really thought that went into that over time. Um, we're not lacking anything in Christ already, but when we continue in the faith of that truth, we begin to naturally act according to who we are. And testings provide the opportunity for us, even when we stumble for us to manifest the nature of Christ, to discover the beauty of God within us, the patience of God within us, that's already there. By the way, the test is never about works. Do you see that up there? The testing of your, is it works? You are never tested on your works, ever. God is not sitting up there testing you on how many works you can do or how good you're at it. You know what you're tested on? How much can you return to his love even when you fall?
How much can you return to your true identity even when everything around you and seemingly in you says otherwise? That's what you're tested on, the gospel, your celebration of the gospel. And as you do that, you become teleo, teleos, mixing them up. You become mature. You become of full age, the fullness of that DNA, that baby DNA of Jesus inside of you manifests and comes forward. Now, to close this up, that's really the heart of what I wanted to share about faith and works and what that means. We're going into this advanced series, right? We're talking about advancing the kingdom. We're talking about the good works that flow from the faith of Christ. And I really wanted us to jump into this a little bit and encourage you all to be a part of that. Be a part of those small groups that are, we're doing the, the advanced series and all of that. Um, that starts in two weeks. But what I wanna say to close up here, I wanna talk about just what does maturity look like as a church? What does maturity mean? What does the milk lead to? Okay, so Christ-likeness, that's the obvious thing. But there's something very specific and it has to do with the word that we gave at the beginning of the year that I believe holds so true to where we're headed and what God is doing in us. I'm gonna read from John 17 and I want you to keep your eyes open for the clue, okay? Jesus was praying and he was asking the Father different things and he said, I and them and you and me that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and loved me even as you have loved them, even as you've loved me. Which is the word, do you think? Perfected. That's the same Greek word. We are perfected, matured in what? Unity. Yeah, unity. Unity is the greatest fruit of the finished work of the cross. As we teleaho, that's what comes forth. Unity and oneness with each other. So that's what we started the year on. If you weren't here on New Year's, I wanna encourage you to go and listen to that word. It's, it's on the internet. We started off with a very clear prophetic word for the whole year based upon Psalm 133, which is all about when people dwell together in unity. By the way, another side note, it blew my mind. Two weeks later, the only scripture that was quoted at the presidential inauguration was Psalm 133, was spoken at the inauguration speech. Psalm 133, which is a psalm of unity. And I really believe that is the word of the Father over our nation, but it starts with us. It doesn't start with complaining, division, backbiting, all that stuff. It starts with us manifesting the love of Jesus Christ, the humility of Jesus Christ. And that, all of that, is simply the proof that we're drinking the gospel, that we are receiving this. It's the expression of living faith inside of us. And I know that faith is in each one of you. Don't receive any condemnation this morning. That faith abides in you. The word of God abides in you. You're strong. You have overcome. But the Lord is quickening that word in your spirit to make you rise up and walk out who you are and not blame circumstances or people or yourself for anything less than the fullness of God in your life. All right? So, Lord Jesus, help us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the pure joy that comes as we begin to discover Christ in us in the midst of temptation and trial and tribulation. Father, thank you for joy that overflows as a sweet, sweet fruit of your spirit because we know who we are and we know who you are. We know your love for us. Thank you, God, that rate, get, uh, grace is radical, that grace is so free. It's offensively free. Grace is hyper, but it puts us in hyperdrive. It puts us light speed and good works. Jesus, I pray for a revelation of grace to manifest in works, in unity, in Jesus' name, amen.